So Pinar Yolders from Duke University, welcome. All right, everyone. Woo. Yeah, my voice is scaring myself, but I hope you can hear me well. And um, there was a technical problem because I just acquired a retina display, but apparently it's not communicating. Um, my name is Panay Oldash, and I'm hailing from Berlin, where I'm doing a, a research residency at the Willem Flusser Archives at UDK, Universität der Kunst. Um, in co co collaboration with uh, Transmediale Festival. But um, what I want to say is I'm, I'm very hungry, actually, and I'm very tired. And I believe you're hungry and tired, too. So I'll try to keep this as fast as possible. And again, I wish I could cook you something. I wish this was a dinner party where we were just enjoying a meal, you know, uh, wine tasting, whatever, instead of looking at some slides. Because um, I happen to be really good at frying things. I fried my hard drive very recently. So I put this presentation just for you. This is like, you're the first audience I'm presenting this to. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Another thing about cooking is, um, I call myself a synaptic sculptor. So my goal as an artist is to tickle your uh, nervous system. And what better way to do it um, other than, you know, cooking and eating, right? But um, today, uh, I'll just start with this project that I'm working on while in, I'm in Berlin. And um, probably until the end of February, or it may um, ex extend to March or April, we'll see. Uh, it's called An Ecosystem of Excess, which also gives the name to my presentation. I could as well name my presentation Sex and death in the 21st century. This is pretty washed out, which is really bad for me because as a visual artist, I rely on images, but I'll just read things out loud and you can ask me questions if you can't see the text. Um, another title could be How to Fabricate Desire and Need uh, Using Cognitive Capitalism 2.0. Or another title could be New anat Anatomies for an Overdeveloped World. But we'll just stick with uh, an ecosystem of excess because it's wide enough. Now, to give you a little bit of history, um, this project is kind of a continuation of another one called Speculative Biologies. Can you see this at all? Okay, good. Um, which was born in 2007. And this project, um, is all about natural excesses multiplied, intensified, and purified. So um, why speculative biologies? Let's start with why biology. Um, biology because it's simply the study of life. So it encompasses everything. Um, biology because it offers a new understanding of materialism. Um, for example, today, we talked about consciousness um, located in our physical body being like a bunch of nuclei that fires together. Or we all know that memories are nothing but proteins, or learning is just protein synthesis. Um, biology, because there is like a very close connection between our understanding of beauty and um, biology and nature. And finally, Biology is the next revolution. So uh, let's move on to uh, Freeman Dyson, this British-American uh, uh, theoretical physician and visionary thinker, who in his essay uh, titled Our Biotech Future, uh, published in 2007, claims that um, just like computer technologies that became domesticated, you know, laptops and mobile devices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Biology and um, synthetic biology will become domesticated as well. So I'll just read uh, what he says. Domesticated biotechnology, once it gets into the hands of housewives and children, will give us an explosion of diversity of new living creatures rather than the monoculture crops that the big corporations prefer. New lineages will proliferate to replace those that monoculture farming and deforestation have destroyed. Designing genomes will be a personal thing. 
a new art form as creative as painting or sculptor. So as an artist, the last sentence really grabs my attention. And um, I don't include, I, I kind of you know, took out those slides about bio art, but I'm just gonna assume that most of you are f familiar with what, with what bio art is. It's basically artists um, tackling with genes and wet material, playing with life in a way. So, um, the next quote that kind of shaped my thinking uh, in speculative biologies comes from feminist thinker Elizabeth Grosch and uh, her reading of Deleuze or her understanding of Deleuzean aesthetics. Um, she says, she suggests that, Deleuze suggests, in opposition to those philosophical or phenomenological approaches to the arts that analyze their intentionality or the mutual engagements of subjects and objects in artworks, that the arts produce and generate intensity that which directly impacts the nervous system and intensifies sensation. Again, what I take out from this is intensifying sensation. And um, in, in the framework of this project, Speculative Biologies, I brought these two things together, that is intensifying sensation and um, manipulating uh, the human genome or manipulating um, tissues and uh, organs. So uh, I'm really interested in textures and surfaces. I myself happen to have a degree in architecture, so I think about surfaces a lot. And these are two of my favorite surfaces. Uh, the first one is the human brain, which is two square feet. Uh, we can translate it to metrics, but I won't be able to do that now. And the second one is the human skin. This is a very bad image. I could not really find like a, you know, skinned human, skin laid out all the way, but this hopefully gives you an idea. And these two textures are in a constant communication. Oh, another thing is, uh, you know, human brain is always thought to be like the seed of consciousness, the seed of everything, the seed of emotion, etc. But um, what actually happens is, it's gathering all this information from our other sensory organs, and skin happens to be the largest sensory organ. So, um, this is the mouse somatosensory cortex, another tissue that connects the brain to the skin. And um, I'm just gonna jump the pen field maps, but yeah, I'm just gonna jump that, because that's a long uh, paragraph. But my idea was to literally take Elizabeth, to take Elizabeth Grosch's um, idea of intensifying sensation, literally, and um, to multiply the receptors and sensors in the skin. So the skin is a very complex organ, it's the composite organ, and it produces composite sensations, such as pleasure, uh, or pain, or touch could also be considered um, composite. And um, in my project, I focused on, I took out the pain receptors, I did not touch them. And uh, an interesting thing about the skin is there are receptors dedicated to sensing pain, which are called nociceptors, but there is no single pleasure uh, sensor. So pleasure is a highly complex sensation. So I focused on that and I multiplied uh, the amount of uh, receptors uh, by 100. And I created these like phenomenological intense textures. So um, another feature of the skin is it's connected with a lot of glands, such as the sweat glands. And I focused on the memory gland, which gives uh, the class mammalia its name. And uh, I started thinking about a creature, an organism that had multipl multiplied uh, memory glands. And ladies and gentlemen, here's a very washed out version of the super mammal, uh, which is a cluster of breasts, basically. I was very happy with this creature when I first came up, came up with this. I was like, oh, this is really all the you know, uh, ideas I had uh, solidified, materialized in one body, and I'm like really proud of myself. 
but it didn't take me long to realize that my ancestors had actually came up with this. This is um, Artemis from, um, from uh, Artemis of es Ephesus from BC 1, I think. Um, another specimen of this project was uh, polyphaly. And in this one, I took the uh, male reproductive organ penis and multiplied it until the meaning, tr uh, meaning threshold was broken. And, and this specimen does not have a central nervous system. It has a very limited behavioral repertoire, which only consists of ejaculation and um, pretty much that. And um, my favorite one was the neolabium, which is kind of a plug-and-play organ based on uh, the conventionally female organ, labium. So in this organ, um, there, are, there is labia minora and labia majora, but there's also labia synthetica, which is endowed with uh, very sensitive uh, receptors, and there are whiskers that can uh, sense uh, the magnetic fields in the air, etc. So this is a very uh, hypersensitive organ. And the idea behind was that by amplifying uh, this organ, by making it much more visible, by granting it with this hypersensitivity, perhaps I could create this like gray zone between, um, a, a gray zone of sexuality. So um, the cool thing about this organ is you can take this out uh, of, you know, genetically XY male can have this organ uh, implanted in him and perhaps uh, it go through neurogenesis uh, while wearing this organ. So more pictures of this project, and um, this is how the neolabium is cultivated. Close-ups and uh, just an image of the installation, uh, I think at Reed College. And um, to finish this one, I'll just show you uh, a one minute video. I hope it works. Synthetic biology is the design of biological systems not found in nature. Speculative biology is an artistic take on synthetic biology. All art modifies and orchestrates the human sensorium. Art plays with sensations. Can we generate new sensations by designing new organs, new biological systems? Can we engineer the human body to multiply? intensify and purify pleasure. Speculative Biology's project proposes new tissues, new organs, and new bodies. These deviant anatomies emerge from Marcus human needs. Organogenesis, excessive repetition of genitalia, produce purely sexual species. Penis, glands, vagina, vulva, labia, are redefined to open up new hedonic possibilities. The site of pleasure, the skin is re-engineered. The nerve endings and blood vessels are multiplied in number. The surface area of labia is increased. A new femininity and masculinity is born. All right, so that was the movie that shows uh, these organs kind of in action. And um, from this point on, I'm going to move on to an animal, a polymer in a site. Um, do we have any questions so far? All right, great. So um, the animal I want to talk about is Vampirotutis infernalis. And we can easily connect this to speculative biologies. and. Um, I, I have to confess, when I was working on speculative biologies, I wasn't reading uh, Flusser. I didn't know that Flusser was also using speculative biology as an intellectual tool. But um, Vampirothutis infernalis is a squid, which uh, Willem Flusser um, 
in his book titled as Vampiro Tutis Infernalis talks about, but the way Fuluser approaches this creature is to basically, um, you know, start a journey into the darkness of uh, the abyss of the ocean uh, to look at this uh, creature organism to reflect back on the human. So it's a very interesting uh, philosophical uh, work of art, I would say. And um, this is the animal, and the molecule is, I just picked polystyrene, but it could have been PVC as well. It's basically a plastic uh, polymer. And why is this interesting to me? Why is this interesting for this project? Because there's something eerie about the way uh, polymerization happens with plastics. So you start with one monomer, which is styrene in this case, and this could be, you know, um, something else. And um, through this excessive repetition, almost like mindless reproduction of the same unit, you end up with a chain. So uh, this process deserves the name in industrial polymerization really well because there is like this kind of parallel between the uh, molecular process of polymerization of plastics and how mass production and um, industrial capitalism kind of works. And the site, uh, this is the site. You can find it on Google Maps, but we don't need to go there. It's called uh, Pacific Trash Vortex. Um, are you familiar with this site? Have you heard of the great Pacific Garbage Patch or Pacific Trash Vortex? This site of floating nexus um, of plastics uh, out there in the ocean. Yeah, well, um, for those of you who haven't heard of it, or just to like refresh our memory, uh, this is a site of um, floating, uh, almost colloidal particles of plastic trash. And uh, there are mainly five gyres in the ocean, and all the gyres actually have plastic particles now, but this one was discovered first in 1985 uh, by, um, by Captain Charles Moore. And um, it's kind of became more and more popular in the last five or six years. And the really interesting thing about this site is it's enormous. Um, it covers, some say it's like twice the size of Texas, some say, some say it's like the size of United States. Uh, it goes about 200 meters deep. And um, what happens is plastic trash from mostly the shorelines, because there's statistics about this, only 5% of the plastic waste comes from ships. 95% comes from the uh, countries and the shorelines, um, you know, around the site. So it's, it's a global monument of our uh, culture of consumerism, our culture of waste. Uh, it's, it's a dynamic, interactive sculpture that's right in the middle of the ocean that grows every day. And um, of course, plastic is uh, immortal. It doesn't die away. It only goes through, through this uh, process called photo, photo degradation, and uh, it turns into nanoparticles, and it ends up in the food chain. And um, it disturbs uh, the flora and fauna of uh, the ecosystem, the pelagic, pelagic ecosystem there. Uh, and because there are new developments that I'm going to talk about very soon uh, in the site, now this place is called the plastosphere, just like atmosphere or cryosphere. Um, and this is a quote by Captain Charles Moore. There's actually a really touching video of him holding um, a sample of, uh, from the Pacific trash vortex. And he's, he goes, the ocean has turned into a, a plastic soup. This is the soup. So um, this is, again, I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this. Um, if not, this is photography by Chris Jordan taken at uh, the Midway Island, um, the only piece of land in the middle of the uh, plastic trash vortex where uh, the lazy and albatross uh, dwells. So the lazy and albatross flies there and it has its nests, everything. It's, uh, uh, reproduces there, and uh, what happens is the birds fly out and ingest all these plastics only to fly back to die. And um, this photographer, Chris Jordan, had been taking pictures of 
the birds by opening their stomachs. There's no like Photoshop or editing in this image. There are many, many images like this. And I'm gonna show you more images of death actually, because I like it. Here we go. This is not the plastic trash vortex. This is a dolphin that died in the BP oil spill. But um, again, I took out all the slides. There is a connection. There's like an obvious connection between the oil spill and plastics, between petrochemicals and the oil industry. So I'm just gonna skip that part. And um, yeah, speaking of Chris Jordan, um, let's see this uh, documentary he's been working on, just like uh, maybe a couple of seconds of it. I hope I can play this. I'll stop here. It's a sad, sad uh, video, but um, since I like sad videos, I'm gonna show you another one. Um, this one is actually happening in Spain, as far as I understood. Um, the footage is kind of ambiguous to me, but I have read these papers, articles about um, whales dying in the uh, coastline of Spain because of the um, greenhouse plastics that's been disposed to the ocean. So it's the same thing. The animal, the non-human animal, approaches plastics as food, digests it, and slowly dials. Um, the soundtrack is kind of cheesy, but I apologize for that. This is uh, the plastics that's been uh, found in, in the whale's digestive tract. And it was a baby whale, which makes everything worse. Um, so, 
Yeah, I showed you the images of negative sublime. So what's next? Yeah, let's talk about death. Uh, uh, the two images, and there are many more like this. Uh, if you just Google plastic ocean, dying animals, etc., cetera. Um, it's a distant death. It's a pelagic death. It's an invisible death to us because, you know, out of sight, out of mind, we don't really see what's happening out there. Um, it's a colloidal death and it's a nano death as well because there's um, protozo and um, algae that's been affected by this as well. Um, but my goal as an artist is not to raise awareness on like the pain and suffering that the whales go through. Although I would also like to do that as a byproduct, but I just want to draw attention to the death that's right here. There is no single moment we spend in our urban routines without touching plastics. And um, again, I don't know if you've heard, but um, as a result, result of my research, I have to read all these depressing papers. And one of them was about phytolates. Have you heard of this substance, phytolates? Um, it's a plasticizer. So the monomer polymer chain I showed you, it's like the very, you know, building block of plastics. It's served as plastic pellets, but to give it its final form, like such as this or these cups, etc., you have to add plasticizers in it. And um, the names of these plasticizers can be very eerie as well. There was a category that I came across that's called POP, which translates to persistent organic pollutant and, uh, or persistent organic poison. And phthalate is one of those which um, enters our bloodstream through our skin and through ingestion because most of our food is packaged with plastics and our homes are decorated with plastics, etc., etc. And uh, phthalates mimic uh, endoc endocrine uh, products in, in our uh, immune system and in our productive system, which causes all kinds of thing, bad things such as cancer and uh, autoimmune disorders and uh, reproductive uh, problems, infertility, etc. But that's a slow death, that's an invisible death. So when death is not up in our face, we kind of tend to skip it, which is fine. So um, let's move back to uh, Flusser a little bit. Uh, in Vampire Thetis Infernalis, he um, talks about exoskeleton and he talks about the human musculature as the spasm that uh, records everything that happens to us uh, as like a cultural um, kind of uh, layer that holds, retains all the information. So the interesting thing to me is that the cultural products that we make, plastics is not just a physical product, it's the product of our culture, gives new shape to the exoskeleton of uh, other elements. Yet uh, life adopts and these, anim these turtles did not die. And life adopts, this is a, a picture from um, the Wood Hole uh, Oceanof Oceanographic Institute's scientists, Linda Emerald Zett Zettler et al. And I've been Skyping with her and they just published this paper in July 5th. And this is a microscopic image of this plastic eating bacteria that is found in the pelagic uh, waters. So what happens is there's this like new ecosystem that's already flourishing in the plastosphere. So the question I asked in my project was, okay, life started in the oceans four billion years ago. Uh, there was like this uh, primordial soup and then, you know, cells emerged, etc. Um, monocellular organisms emerged, etc. What if life started in the oceans of today, which is full of plastics? So, following that and following Linda Amaral Zettler's work, I've been um, thinking about, uh, this is a, the picture of a dinoflagellata, also known as um, the glowing algae, and um, I've been working on uh, genetically modifying plastic eating bacteria to, to make it glow. Hopefully we'll see the results in February or late April. Just keep, keep up with the project, I guess. And um, another outcome of the project is I'm also looking at uh, this kind of um, second order ecosystem and I'm designing the relationships between different organisms that will inhabit such a system. 
And uh, bear in mind, these organisms are different than us because they are feeding on our cultural products. So there is like this interesting twist there. So far, we have a plastic collecting fish. We have an aquatic insect that covers plastic particles so that uh, big mammals can eat them. And we have new digestive organs and um, hormonal glands that can um, synthesize plastic and consume plastic. So um, I'll finish here. Um, I just want to say that this is a very interesting time to be an artist or to be a cultural producer. Uh, again, in May 9th, I think, we reached the uh, like, uh, highest carbon dioxide levels in the planet. And uh, I myself get bored about environmental preaching and like, you know, well, let's save the planet kind of discourse. But I also feel like uh, it's our responsibility to uh, think about these and uh, to make work that will um, hopefully um, address the condition of life or lack thereof. Um, that's it, thank you. Sorry, Zach, I think I ran out of time. You'll have to speed up, but.